again, I reiterate the appreciation we have is when you have a man that is 76 years young and standing there strong and willing to say it, we got to take it from what we call back in the day our elders. And you got to respect that. Like we sitting around the fire in Africa and the elder is telling us a story. This is what it is, but this story is about reality. And the moment we decide to stick together, not just as black people, but our white allies, those who, because we live in a system that they want to deny us the history that's taking place, but when they deny black history, they're also denying the white history of the abolitionists who weren't about that. See, they're also denying that. So these people still exist. So uh, the Jessica Chastain's, that stood up for, uh, was it Octavia Spencer? Mm -hmm. You know, Octavia. those individuals need to hear this story and understand how could a show that was made for under $70 million over five years have repeated returns of over $100 million. And by 2009, oh. after the show, no, no, by 2009, uh, uh, four years after the show went off in 2004, the, the, uh, we see a, a, a return that says this show has made over $700 million in gross revenue, but yet it's in a billion or close to a billion dollar deficit. And these two women, Countess Monique, at the end of their five years, now you got to understand, number one show first year, the fi finale ended up with 3.6 million people at the end of it. And the finale in the 50, 110 episode. And in their fifth year together, they made one hundred and ten thousand dollars together. Uh, I want I wanted I wanted to ask, speaking of white people and the actors and the white allies and abolitionists, when you look at Friends, Frasier, Seinfeld, right? How are how are how are their shows like? I mean, you're talking about the money that they still see now. Um, how, how did they how did they get to how did they get a good deal? And maybe it's because they stuck together, right? Um, but what is the difference between those shows and the Monique's, you know, um, Judge Joe Brown show? What is the difference and why they get a better deal? Yeah. Who's gonna catch that lob? <laughs> you already know the answer. Like and and, 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 and see again. Is it because they're white? Is well, no, let me let me add something to that. You whisper in white. <laughs> let me let me add something to that. There is a difference in degree and also a qualitative degree. You remember the show, So You Want to Be a Millionaire? Mm -hmm. yes, sir. I was all white. But the difference is they were able to secure adequate legal counsel and they pursued their claim against ABC and Walt Disney for years and black people wound up paying for abc disney's mess up f up and wrongdoing what happened is they sued for several million dollars they won in california state courts went all the way up to the california supreme court where they still won abc and disney went filed in federal court and wound up getting to the ninth circuit well the Ninth Circuit full panel, when they got it, has interesting language. It says, basically, we find this strange since this institution seems singularly unable to comprehend the first rule of American contract law, colon, all parties are expected to deal with each other in good faith, comma, perhaps we can do something about this period. And instead of awarding the plaintiffs their several million dollars that they were seeking, they came up with an award of $580 million. The Supreme Court denied review, so that stood. That was back in 2011. Now, by the time we get to 2017 or 18, what has happened is that judgment with the interest was reportedly on the north end of a billion dollars, a billion and a quarter. So Hollywood doesn't have all that ready cash hanging around. 
and the courts gave them a limited time to pay something on the outstanding interest. So what they did is they came up with the Black Panther movie, which turned out to be the highest grossing superhero movie of all time. They gave a very horrible story, which I've explained the time or two in terms of the insult and the negative language that was in it. It was not something we should celebrate, but black people came out in droves, bought tickets far in advance so they could have groups to go see and they could wear sandals and gaudy replicas or fantasy ideas of what African clothing looks like and sit in the audience with their headdresses on and have a good time, not paying attention to what was actually being displayed and they played down, paid down the interest. At that point, basically, the plaintiffs still had liens on most of the rides in Disneyland and Disney World and on most ABC properties around the country. So the interest built up again. So they had Wakanda, too, where black folk came out again, did a lot of box office. They got a lot of cash flow and paid down the interest rates. So that's how it works for white folk. With black folk, you have too many black people, and I'll name another one, Byron Allen. I'm going to get to him in a second. What you wind up with is going along to get along, who act like Hollywood wants them to act, so they try to encourage everybody else to act that way too, so they don't have to explain what they're doing. Now, CBS had an agreement with Fox that said that CBS could not get directly on cable or satellite unless they went through Fox. Aside from that proposition being unpopular to the leftist side of the spectrum that tended to patronize CBS, it was inconvenient. There was an exception to that, which was if they went through a minority contract. So when you heard Byron Allen trying to get that channel on cable, what he was trying to do was front off for CBS and everything that was supposed to be on that channel was already on cable or satellite. There was going to be no new production. No new people would be discovered. Nobody would be directing. Nobody would be producing. No money would be made except off of the already contracted for, already established residual prospects that were already airing, but it was a way for CBS to get directly on cable to satellite using Byron Allen. So all the black folk are hollering about, they're trying to cut the brother off, blah, blah, blah. No, he was just fronting. Now, I don't like him because of what he tried to do with me. We recorded him and some CBS uh, executives at the 2014 uh, NAPTI convention or 2013 NAPTI convention in, I think it was Miami at the time. And we found out what he was doing and he did just exactly what we recorded him trying to do. So it was not pretty. Now we got another thing going about him trying to buy Disney. He's not buying Disney. He doesn't have the money. That's CBS again trying to acquire more assets on behalf of Viacom. So once again, we are getting some people who are acting as Hollywood wants them to act, going along with that to get everybody else to go along. And all the woke black folk are chiming in again somebody black is going to get Walt Disney. No, it's not. It's just somebody fronting off and nobody black's going to get anything out of this, except mm-hmm. somebody him is going to get another little dose of chump change. So, so we have to be aware of it. These two we have here, Dana, they actually stand up, they walk to walk, talk to talk, they do the right kind of thing and aren't just going along to get along. Um. Testing, testing, testing. Um, I think turn turn your AC down just a little bit more. Okay, that's fine. Because I, I don't I don't hear an echo anymore. Um, I wanted I wanted to to mention it seemed everything that you just broke down. So when Hollywood is in trouble or CBS or they're in debt or bankrupt because the show is suing them from cheating them out their money, it will create a black production like Wakanda to pay off their debt. Yeah, well, this isn't new. 
right. 50 years no, ago, no, Hollywood no, was going broke. It is, it is, wait, wait. Exploitation. Right. Well, this isn't, this practice isn't new, but it's new to me. It's new to everyone out here, all black people, because we, people want to see what content, we have no idea that in Hollywood, we are being used as chattel. Um, you will use this chattel when it's politics, Hollywood and finance in every aspects system here in America. Um, we are being used to bail out. Um, and so going to your situation with the Parkers, again, using the Parkers to build other shows and pay you less exportation. All right. Oh, yeah. It, it's very bad. And it's ongoing and probably at heart one of the most racist institutions you're going to find remaining in America is centered on Hollywood. So what and, should we do going forward? But go ahead, Monique. I'm sorry. Well, and I think too, Dana, one of our biggest problems is it's not just white that will exploit you. It's not just white. It, it is really disheartening when you look at people that look like you and they're smiling and they're saying, we love you. We love your babies. We love your family. But they are setting you up to get taken advantage of. Tyler Perry as an example. Yes. Tyler Perry is an example. When Monique shoots a movie called Almost Christmas, David Talbot, who I went to Morgan State University with, right across the hall from me, who was the director of that movie, he calls me up after he sees Tyler Perry and he says, I saw Tyler Perry and he asked, how was it working with Monique on this film? And I had to tell him, man, it was incredible. And he said, well, that wasn't my experience when I worked with Monique. She was a little bit difficult to work with. So we went in, on our podcast and we discussed what it was that he said because we didn't understand. And Lee had gone on prior to him coming back to apologize, had gone on and spoke about Monique was making difficult demands. Well, in our community, people thought because she won the Academy Award, now all of a sudden she was trying to be a grand diva. The difficult demand that was uh, uh, alleged was due to me personally getting a call and they reached out to ask because Monique had done such a wonderful job promoting the movie while it was owned by the Magnuses and uh, LDE, which was Lee Daniels Entertainment. Since they acquired the movie, they wanted to know would Monique be willing to travel to Cannes to promote this film for them under the guise of her having the ability to campaign for the Oscar award. For Lionsgate. I'm sorry, Lionsgate. Mm -hmm. So when I spoke with Tyler Perry, he was like, listen, don't you understand this opportunity? If Moni campaigns for this award, if she gets nominated, she could get a, a three to five million a picture. If she wins six to eight million dollars. And we had to explain to him, brother, she's a black woman. That's not what it is that she's going to do. In addition to the fact that her stance was, how do I lobby for an award when it should be based upon my performance? What I'm going to do instead is spend this time with my family. However, what I had posed to the lady and Tyler, who had come back two and three times asking, what can we do to get her to change our mind? I said, was there a dollar amount that you wanted me to go back to Monique in reference to, uh, to propose so that she may consider this? It became a Smucker's Jelly a commercial where the guy said, would you please pass the jelly? And oh, they, they about to black out. Like, so that's how she achieved the, the moniker of being difficult. There's an audio where we recorded Tyler Perry essentially saying, and we put it out there to the public, where he said, if it was him and somebody called him difficult, we're not essentially committing an act of slavery because last time I checked, you are not any breach of contract for not doing something with someone who you don't have an agreement with. We got a judge here. So I think yeah. he confirmed that. So when you have that dynamic and he says, I'm going to make it right. When I go out to promote my next movie, Boo 2, I know people are going to ask me and I'm going to make it right. Because he asked, offered Monique a half million dollars because he said, I felt bad about that. What that was, we felt like was if you take that money 
you might as well stop talking about it. And the amount of money that we lost up in that was in the double digits of millions. We can't take that. What we would prefer you do is the right thing. Because I oftentimes hear him talking about God, religion. He gave T.D. Jakes a million dollar check, got the pop locking that. He it. did it, electric boogaloo. <laughs> so I respect that. But the man, that was 2016, we're in 2023, and he's never come out. So the point is, when you have people that are gods in this entertainment business and people view them as that, I liken it to the Bible. And some <laughs> people are going to get mad, but look at what I'm about to say objectively. Where do you know that an individual could send their children out into the wilderness, buck naked, without knowledge, and they're still deemed a hero, but the devil is the one that introduced them to the knowledge. When you have people in this world that are deemed gods, what happens is what took place with Whoopi Goldberg, where it wasn't about was Monique right or wrong in reference to not promoting something that she had no contractual obligation to promote. What was put forth was, I could have schooled you and told you what Lionsgate expect. See, when you're the God, it's not about whether it's right or wrong. It's about, you know, you don't go against the gods. And we saying, listen, we were given what you call free will. And our free will is we love everybody and we love everybody so much that we feel compelled to say the truth. Regardless, because guess what? Tyler Perry, Oprah Winfrey, she sat back in silence and never said that this black woman was right for taking the position she took. But you can hear her story of her introduction into being a talk show host. It was because she was treated unfairly when she was in Baltimore, Maryland, when people are talking, when she was co-host with Richard Chair and she was paid less than half of what he was paid. But you're going to sit, sit back silently while Monique is being... Uh, demonized, but you go to bat for a gentleman named Harvey Weinstein on a CBS morning show with your good, good girlfriend, Gail King. Oh, by the way, let's talk about her. I was in the same special CBS syndicated unit with Judge Judy, Oprah Winfrey, Dr. Phil, and Judge Joe Brown. The person who was assigned uh, the executive authority over that unit was a guy named Roger King. His father invented television syndication. Our gang, um, the Three Stooges, Laurel and Artie, the old black and white cartoons and movies and such like way back in the late 40s and early 50s. He discovered Oprah. He discovered Phil. He managed Oprah's money, set up own for her, and then he died suddenly. He came to me and he said, you know what, Judge, I like you. He said, I just discovered that they've been trying to down you because you are an intelligent black man who will not put up with their shit. Come on. He said, I'm going to help you out. And you see what happened is when they started the unit off, I was doing pretty well in the ratings. It was uh, out of that unit. I was beating Phil, but it was uh, Judy, Oprah and me then Phil. So he said, I'm going to fix this. And when we got through before he died, it was Judy and Joe. Oprah was behind us and I was beating her every week in the ratings. But you see, Oprah was the poster child for something that Roger King was supposed to be doing. Now, You've got a whole, I won't even get into some of the other stuff that he told me that he was doing with that. But a lot of it was an illusion that the public still buys. And there is a truth about that. You tell a lie long enough and loud enough, you get anybody to believe it. One example, can you do one example that Oprah never read all those damn books that she was promoting? No, Roger anymore. King was picking her books for her. He and didn't her know what was going on. So he stopped because he died some years ago. So a lot of stuff she was picking was no longer Roger King picking it. It was Oprah picking it. And that's why you got some of that mess. Now, 
See, black people don't realize this. We subsidized Hollywood back in the 60s. When you went to a movie in 1967, Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, the movies changed every Thursday and Sunday, every Thursday and Sunday. And you got two movies, two or three cartoons and maybe a sub feature. And you walked in anytime you wanted to and you paid 50 cents. All right. Television, color television was coming into its own and the movie studios were going broke trying to finance this. So they came up with two bright ideas. Let's just show them one movie, triple the price. Nobody's going to go do it except black people will be so anxious to see themselves that they will do it, meaning they'll go spend their money to see something black. So instead of 50 cents to go see a movie, they started charging a buck and a quarter, a buck and a half. You walked in before the show started. When it was over, you walked out and that movie stayed as long as people would support it. They started out with Black Caesar starring uh, Fred the Hammer Williams, a football player. And then within a few months, a year and a half, they went to Superfly. And you got this poison that got put down our throats because the idea was is instead of coming up with something uplifting for black folk, let's just get black people to spend their money. So let's appeal to the lowest common denominator. So they wanted it adventurous and you got into glorifying pimps, hoes, drug dealers, murderers, thieves, burglars, gangsters, uh, crazy folk. And that's who they started pushing. You quickly morphed into uh, uh, Foxy Brown with Pam Greer. She looked beautiful, but they had two types of movies in those days. Those that they could show to most audiences in America, not just PG and X rated and all of that. And those they showed in Europe or in select places in special shows. So if you looked at those, they always had a formula. There were four or five completely naked but wet white women who took a shower and would walk through the room with a towel across one shoulder. And Pam Greer would be barely dressed and she'd get knocked down and knocked out and one or two boobs would pop out at least seven or eight times during the movie. And the theme started out where her brother would be murdered by the drug dealers and she would be getting revenge and not just her shows but all of them and then it would quickly morph into the brother was a drug dealer and he got knocked out by bigger drug dealers so the woman his sister comes in and she kills off everybody so she can be the queen pin of the drug rackets and you had superfly that came in a little before that and it glorified selling cocaine and people having pimp hats and, you know, pressed hair and driving pimp mobiles instead of dashikis, plain dashikis and afros and ready for the revolution. It was this thing of glorification of dysfunction. And they got a lot of money. And every time Hollywood has been strapped for cash, one or two or three studios collaborate and they get a black movie that black folk will flock to see. And on Panther, the tragedy of it is, is the penultimate battle scene is the men and women of the tribe trying to kill each other and everybody's out there cheering for this foolishness. Don't judge him, Joe Brown.